Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. With men, Lisa played both ends against the middle, sometimes with wild results. <laughs> Starring John Mills as Intertel Inspector Buloff, engaged in a death struggle against a worldwide narcotics ring. European film favorite Robert Hoffman as Max, hired killer, hooked on Lisa, but ordered by her... Inspector, you surely know what kind of wife you've got. <laughs> Glamorous Luciana Paluzzi, reaching screen stardom as Lisa, using her beauty like a weapon to entice and destroy. A tulip stand, a honky-tonk carnival, a gambling casino. Which one held the clue to one of the deadliest of crimes? Every man wants a Lisa. Fears a Lisa. What's the idea? I want you to uh, do something for me. Even with a killer in her room, Lisa makes it hard for men to keep their cool. And welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for this number 48 in the Italian collection from 88 Films. This is a black veil for Lisa from 1968. The website says... The Jalo was still finding its feet when a black veil for Lisa came along in 1968 and along with such earlier murder mysteries as Blood and Black Lace from 1964 and So Sweet So Perverse from 1969, this classic outing proved important to the genre that later filmmakers such as Dario Argento and Sergio Martino would help to define. Featuring an assured leading man turn from the legendary British Oscar winner John Mills, who was in Gandhi, A Black Veil for Lisa was overseen by iconic Massimo Delamano of What Have You Done to Solange and offers an engrossing tale of sex and assassination as a frustrated detective plans to murder his cheating wife via hired hand for the entire plot to become more muddled, macabre and messy. Coloured by all number of crafty giallo twists, and the only the Italians could do is during the heady of Hitchcockian horror, A Black Veil for Lisa makes its British Blu-ray in this outstanding HD transfer from 88 Films. Special features on the disc are a 1080p presentation of the film on Blu-ray, an uncompressed LPCM audio, optional English SDH subtitles, Yellow is the New Black, Rachel Nisbet on a Black Veil for Lisa, an interview with the film journalist Rachel Nisbet. Lifting the Veil, remembering Massimo Dallamano's A Black Veil for Lisa, an interview with film journalist, journalist sorry, John Martin. Theatrical trailer, reversible sleeve with alternate poster design. The technical specs, region locked to region B, audio is LPCM stereo, pictures 1080p, HD 178 1. The runtime is just under an hour and a half, and both English uh, is the language and subtitles of this disc. Now, this is one that I thought I knew. 
to be fair. Not one that I thought I'd seen, but one that I thought I knew. So I, I was fairly sure I knew what this movie was and who was in it before sitting down to watch it and then very quickly realised this was not the movie I thought it was. In fact, I'm now at, I can kind of complete loss to work out what movie I actually thought A Black Veil for Lisa was. But now having seen it, I can assure myself and of no interest to any listener listening just now that I know which movie this isn't. Um, so there we go. And I, God knows if we'll ever find the movie that was in my head. Um, where I start with A Black Veil for Lisa? So obviously in the kind of 88 films blurb, they're touching on a few key things here of interest. One being Massimo Delamano, um, a guy whose filmography is wild and interesting. A guy who... Uh, kind of has more prominence in the world of cinematography, working with Sergio Leone on a couple of his more prominent Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns. And, you know, if you have Leone's kind of support and backing to an extent to be behind the camera on those movies, you know this guy is more than just a cut above the rest when it comes to cinematography. And that's where A Black Veil for Lisa really fucking shines. The cinematography in this movie is inventive, it's fun, it's quirky, the camera's all over the place. It's got some really interesting positions and compositions of shots. And it, it kind of took me back because a lot of that flair is associated with Dario Argento, kind of post-1970, post A Bird with the Crystal Plumage. But here we are, two years previous to this, and Delamano's kind of doing that sort of stuff. Interesting tracking shots, cameras and graves, um, you know, like weird angles, uh, beautiful use of location. This movie, I believe, is shot in Hamburg. So it kind of is more akin to the uh, the kind of core of where Giallo comes from, which is some of those German crime mysteries. And this one definitely is ripping its tits right out of its chest with um, kind of the, the Hitchcockian play on the murder mystery thriller. This really doesn't resemble that much of the grim gruesomeness that comes with kind of post uh, Bird with a Crystal Plumage. This very much feels like someone's take on a run of the mill Hitchcockian thriller. And I don't use that lightly. I mean that in that while I was watching this movie every step of the way, I was like, oh, I know what happens. Oh, I bet you this happens, and it totally did. There was nothing in the plot that really surprised in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the first half of this movie is more kind of a murder mystery police procedural with this guy uh, who has a bit of a troubled home life kind of tracking down this hitman. And that's where the movie like really grins itself and then the second half of the movie our detective who's insanely jealous of his very attractive and much younger girl um, or wife uh, finds this hitman and then instead of bringing him in to face justice essentially blackmails the hitman to kill his wife um, and then you get like an interesting little three way which we'll, we'll kind of talk about when I say three way get your mind out the gutter I mean, uh, I kinda almost a Mexican try standoff. Don't think that's a thing, but let's do it. Let's just see it as why not? We can do whatever we want in this show. Um so yeah, that's where the story kinda really morphs into more of the the uh, kind of crazy quirkiness of a giallo. But I mean I'm, it doesn't really resemble much kind of post bird with the crystal plumage in a lot of respects that kind of hinders it. It also benefits it. I mean, so we're not seeing people just completely rip off Argento over and over and over again. But at the same time, this doesn't feel like it's a fresh outing for the time period. I mean, if you look at Massimo Delmano's kind of two, kind of, I would say giallos, although uh, what have they done to your daughters is certainly not a giallo. It's more of a kind of police procedural um, kind of style of movie making, but what have we done to Solange? Definitely, you know, in that giallo camp. I mean, this one doesn't really bear much resemblance to the, the daringness of those two movies. It certainly is a bit more, like I say, paint by numbers thriller, and there is a place and time for that, and certainly, I mean, the story made sense. The characters' motivations kind of made sense in a weird sort of filmic way. And it sums itself up and wraps itself up in a fairly tight, neat bow without 
much in the way not fitting the narrative. So it's already much better than some of the later giallo, which don't make a lick of sense, don't try and make a lick of sense and reveal a killer who you've only seen maybe right at the very start of the movie. So, I mean, this one is kind of well thought out. It's just that the well thought out manner of it is just derivative of other movies that have come before. So, I was kind of thinking, oh, it was fun, but the the way this movie kept my attention in was twofold, first in the cinematography and secondly in the score. The score is that kind of late 60s thriller, it's very frantic at times, it's huge sounding, um, and I absolutely loved that, I thought it complemented what was happening on the screen really well. And the cinematography, which is very much the selling point for this movie. If you're if you're someone who enjoys a visual eye, then this is a great movie to watch. And it's a bit more coherent than some of the later day Argentos. So this is a bit pedestrian on story, but it's giving you a lot of bang for buck with the camera work. So, I mean, it's in that category. There's also a ton of nods to what we would class as, like, standard fare in the, the kind of giallo world. I mean, until the killer is revealed, and he is revealed kind of early on, is he kind of gloved killer who's doing all the killings. Um, this has references to G&B whiskey. Uh, there are tons of references specifically to the colour yellow. So, I mean, it, it fits in very comfortably with a lot of the tropes that we would as- associate with it. It just is lacking the panache in the story, the weirdness, the quirkiness to, to really sell it. I mean, overall, A Black Bale for Lisa is quite an enjoyable watch. It's just not a great watch. This isn't one where you're going to be sitting there going, I feel like this should be on the tip of everyone's tongues when talking about Giallo. I can see why this one's maybe a bit more obscure and maybe doesn't get talked as much because it's out with that cinematography. It doesn't have the flair or the punch or even the kills to an extent. This is a, a very light on death sort of murder mystery movie and even the way they do it isn't gratuitous like they're going to be doing in the 70s where we're going to be seeing all sorts of viscera be torn from people and even the ending is a bit kind of in fact the ending tracking shot is one of those things where you just go this is a genius cinematographer at work um the end of this movie ends up in this forest where trees are quite widely spaced apart and almost symmetrically planted we have this long running tracking shot of the police trying to catch the killer. Um, the thing I was talking about in the kind of three way as well is there is a bit of depth to the character and the story. Like I say, it just plays it a bit too serious. Our protagonist, the police officer here, beats on his wife. So he's not really the sort of guy you should be cheering for and he's hired a hitman to kill her. The hitman himself, who is the antagonist in the movie, is going around murdering people but shows real tenderness when it comes to his interactions with Lisa, pretty much falling in love with her. And then you have Lisa herself, who is a wildly complex character, not just kind of happy being in the one, kind of one beat or one note in there. She is very aware of her kind of sexuality, her prowess, and her ability to manipulate men, but is clearly oblivious, even though she is quite smart, clearly oblivious to the world around her. Uh, specifically as pertains to what her husband has planned for her. So when it comes to scoring a Black Veil for Lisa, I'm kind of torn a little bit because the cinematography makes me want to score this one super high, but I have to be kind of honest and genuine to myself. The plot is just... The plot and the story are just a bit basic here. And as a result for that, I can't really go higher than a 3.5. It is definitely one that I will revisit again and again. I think... Not necessarily that there's a lot to mine here, but it's a fairly inoffensive story that doesn't require too much of the brain power, but does give you that style behind the camera work, some incredible shots, and a magnificent score to keep your interest peaked throughout. I think a 3.5 probably fits this movie well, and it's definitely one that I would recommend, but if you were getting into Giallo, I probably wouldn't herald this one as a necessary watch. It's rather one of those ones that you should tick off at the fringes to understand why the genre was shaped the way it was, and kind of how it evolved. Because this one is, if this was Pokemon, this would be the first stage of evolution in a Pokemon, and by the time you get to something like a Tenebrae, we're involving right up 
to like like a super Pokemon. So I think that analogy not only is wrong, but it dates me horribly and kind of shows that yes, I like Pokemon, but not enough to know about all the stages of evolution. So yeah, I mean it's it is it's certainly one that you should be aware of. If you can get it cheaply uh, from 88 Films, do so. If it's in the sale, pick it up for sure. I got the limited edition uh, kind of slip sleeve version, which has um, uh, like a lobby card or something inside it. And I will say that the special features, both of them really quite interesting. There's a great uh, piece by Rachel Nisbet, who really knows her shit. Um, and the the other piece by the, the film kind of historian is pretty good as well. So it's worth picking up the disc as well. The print's great, sound is brilliant because of that score. It looks pretty great, but overall, a 3.5 is where I land with this title.